Good morning. <laughs> it's so good to see all of you. So good. Um, what a blessing. Last week we looked at First uh, Peter verses one and two, and Sally gave the introduction of that letter that Peter wrote to the apostles, um, also to the those that were scattered abroad that were suffering, and um, he chose the word elect. Uh, and referred to them as the elect chosen by God. And so we saw that in the introduction of Peter's letter, uh, themes of hope, themes of faith, themes of his grace, and, and also of perseverance. So as we pick up today in First Peter, we're going to read through verses 3 through 12. So I'm going to read those verses, and then I'm going to come back and just talk about each verse as the Holy Spirit leads me. So, starting at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. I just love those verses. They were really blessed me throughout the week uh, as I read through them. And in verse 3 where he says, Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This phrase just expresses such a profound um, just worship to our God, to our Lord. Just a recognition of who he is and his sovereignty and his grace and his mercy. Attributes. He has many attributes, but these attributes here that we see in this first verse where he talks about the abundant mercy. And we know that God's mercy is not giving us what we deserve because we deserve judgment. We deserve death. But because of his abundant mercy, he withholds that punishment and he gives us the grace instead. We know that his grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Um, And we also know that his grace is not just for salvation, but his grace is what helps us to live each and every day, no matter what we're going through, no matter what the suffering is. And I really, I'm so grateful for that, for the grace of God. We see in uh, scriptures like Ephesians 2, 4 through, and 5, and 8 and 9, it says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, through faith and not of yourselves, but it's a gift from God, um, lest anyone should boast. He says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And again, just these reminders of how much he loves us. We see in Psalm 86, 5, God says to us, For you, Lord, are God and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. So whoever calls upon the name of Jesus, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever just says to Jesus, I need you, come into my heart, he hears. 
He hears. He hears us. <sighs> I think of Psalm 103, 8 through 12, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Right? Slow to anger. And then he reminds us in Titus 3, 3 through 7, that for we ourselves, we also were foolish. We were disobedient, deceived by various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the God we serve. That's the God that loves us so much that even when we were sinners, he died for us. And the moment we repented, he received us as his precious daughters. He received us. And I, that, that just, when I think about that, it's hard to fully comprehend God's love. We see in scriptures like Romans 8, 24 and 25, he says, for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, right? For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Right? And I love Lamentations. You guys know this verse, that his mercies are new every morning. I don't know about you guys, but I know I mess up daily. But God says his mercies are new every morning. He doesn't hold things against us when we come to him and repent of our sins and ask for forgiveness. His mercies are new every morning. He's right there, the loving father. His, he is with his arms wide open, just ready to embrace and love us. How often are we ready to embrace and love those who hurt us and who sin against us? Mm-hmm. But God does. And if we, in this scripture, he says, he has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. If Jesus hadn't risen on the third day, ascended to heaven, came back where it says many saw him, and now he's sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father, our hope would be just useless. There would be no hope. He is our hope. So I want to read to you what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, starting at verse 12 through 22 for those of you who's following along. It says, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. That's a scary thought. Verse 18, it says, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. pitiable. Verse 20, it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead, hallelujah, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is risen, and our faith is not futile. And this is something that we should be sharing with the world through the way we live our life. Mm-hmm. I thank God. I thank him for sending his son, for sending Jesus. In verse 4, it goes on to say, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. We have a spiritual inheritance that is incorruptible, ladies, is immortal. 
You think about the inheritance that some people have that their earthly fathers give them, whether it's a home, a car, or even money. Those things fade away. But the inheritance we have never fades away, and it's guaranteed. And I want to uh, take you to Ephesians 1, verse 3. And I, I, I love this, uh, just the description of the spiritual inheritance that we have that the Word of God speaks of in Ephesians 1 through 3. I mean, Ephesians 1, starting at verse 3. It says, blessed, you hear, see that uh, verse again, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I love that. I just love that. Every spiritual blessing. He didn't say some. He said every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So we see in verse 4, it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We've been elected. In verse 5, he says, Have predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. We have been adopted. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That's a demonstration of his grace. We see in verse 7, in him we have redemption. He says, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You see that word grace just keeps coming up. We would be lost without his grace. We see in verse 8 and 9, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. He blesses us with wisdom and with understanding. Verse 10, the revelation of God's plan. He revealed his mystery to us. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. Verse 11, we see the inheritance again. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works in all things according to the counsel of his will. In verse 13 and 14, we see where he sealed us with the Holy Spirit. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of the truth, having believed, that's critical, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, a promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's our God. That's our Jesus. This is what he has done for us. In verse 5, it says, and, and before I go to verse 5, let me just contrast God's holy, what Jesus has done for us and our spiritual inheritance we have with what the Bible tells us as far as physical things and human life and how sometimes people look at human, you know, possessions that we have. Job in Job 14.2 said, He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like, flees like the shadow and does not continue. Matthew in 6.30 says, The grass of the fields which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. In Isaiah, he talks about that analogy of the grass again. In Isaiah 46, 7 through 8, he says, The grass withers, the flower fades, because of the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are like grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. The word of God will never perish. What we have will never perish. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, later on in this chapter, you'll see, uh, probably next week, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Why am I keep talking about these? I want to press upon our hearts how important the word of God is. And that's what Peter, when he wrote this letter, he's reminding the believers and us today that even though we may go through much we're going to suffer. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have our spiritual inheritance that is sealed. It's not going anywhere. It's being guarded. It's being kept for us. What a blessing. In verse 6, um, 
And he talks about, and, and before, again, um, let me back up. He says in verse 5, the power of God. This is so important. Again, speaking of the Holy Spirit, that is that dunamis power. Sometimes I need to remember that I have the power of the Holy Spirit living in me because when I remember that, I look at things differently. So I don't, I don't f- have to fret and be worried and anxious and scared when things are going on, whether it's things going on in the world or things going on in my family life or, or whatever it is. We have the Holy Spirit living in us to help us every single day. Paul talked about that uh, power, that dunamis power in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So Paul expressed that desire to have a deep, intimate relationship with Christ, not just the intellectual knowledge of Christ. He wanted to experience that transformative power that only comes through the Holy Spirit. And every day we get to experience that when we stay connected to Christ, right? So in verse 6, it says, In this you greatly rejoice. So all these previous verses, 3, 1 through 5, we greatly rejoice in the resurrection of Christ. We greatly rejoice in the grace of Christ. We greatly rejoice in all that God has done for us, right? And so when we focus on that, then again, the sufferings, And it's not to minimize our sufferings, but we don't focus on our sufferings. In Isaiah 26.3, God said, He who keeps his mind steadfast on me, I will keep in perfect peace. Right. So when we're going through sufferings, if we're not experiencing the peace of God, which we have because he is our peace, it's because we're focusing on what we see with our natural eyes instead of focusing on what we don't see. And you all know the scripture God has told us throughout scripture. In 2 Corinthians don't, chapter 4, don't focus on what you see. Right? The afflictions are temporary. Don't focus on that. Focus on my word. All right? And so then we go on to see in verse 6 uh, as well, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while. I love that he put little while. Right? Because when we're going through, don't we seem like sometimes it's never going to end? But he said it's only for a little while. And if Jesus said little, God said, it's little. Now, for us, it may seem big, but he says a little wow, right? And that will only last as long as it's necessary to accomplish whatever it is God is wanting to accomplish in our life. And I can tell you what he's wanting to accomplish in our life is good, even if it doesn't feel good. It is a good thing that he's doing. So if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. We can rejoice in that. I think about uh, J- Jesus in John 16, 33. He told us in this world you will uh, have much tribulation. But what did he say? Be of good cheer, right? I have overcome the world. This is our Lord and Savior saying, in this world, there's going to be tribulation. Peter, in 1 Peter 4, 12, don't think it's strange when you encounter these trials. James 1 and 2, 1, 2 talks about count it all joy. There's a purpose, right? And we can go on and on with that, but there is a purpose, and it's a good purpose. And we see in verse 7 that the purpose of that is that the genuineness of our faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You probably, many people use the analogy, and even here we use the analogy of the gold being tested and it being refined. God says we're so much more precious than that. The world puts so much emphasis on gold and stuff. God says we're so much more precious than that, and he's testing our faith. And again, it's, a, it's purpose, purposeful. So for us, you know, the trial just... Uh, it, it, it brings uh, out character, and it helps us to trust him even more when, we, when he brings us through it. It's nothing that we do. The Holy Spirit does it all. Jesus has already done it all. We just have to believe and keep trusting and keep walking with him. And as a result of the trials, the strengthening, the grace that God gives us, there should be just this profound praise and and that we have towards 
our Lord and our Savior towards our God. That should be the result of it. We should be thanking him. It's like the song we sang, hallelujah. I know this isn't much that's fit for a king, but hallelujah. Hallelujah for all that you have done and all that yet awaits us. Job said in Job 23.10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So Job believed, even though, and we know the story of Job, many of us, all that he went through, and this is what he said, he knew that the trial had a purpose. He knew God allowed it for a purpose. In Psalm 66.10, it says, For you, O God, have tested us, you have refined us, as silver is refined. Again, he tests us. In Isaiah 48.10, he says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. And God is right there with us the whole time when we're going through. He never leaves us. And we know that one day, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15 tells us, each one's work will become clear. So the things that we do, the motive for why we do it will be tested. It says, for that, for the day will declare because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will touch each, each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he will receive a reward. But if someone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so is so fire. So what's the application for us? The application for us when we go through difficult times is to keep our focus on God, to rely on the, the Holy Spirit, his strength, his help, not our own. That's the application for us. And to have that eternal perspective. In verse 8, he says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And again, how can, how can we not have joy when we know Jesus? But how often do we see some Christians walking around or living their life defeated? as if there's no hope. Jesus is our hope. He is our hope. He is our joy. He is our peace. That should bring about just that inexpressible joy, that joy that we can't even comprehend, that we can't even fully express. I tell you, when I think about all that Jesus has done and when I read his living word, I can't fully grasp his love. I want to, and I know that I will the day that I'm in his presence. I will fully grasp and understand that love. It says, though, whom whom having not seen you love. we never seen him, but we see him in each other and how we treat each other. So how are you treating your sister? How are you treating your neighbor? Hopefully it's in a way... That's reflecting Jesus. We see his love every morning. He wakes us up. Even now as we're sitting here breathing, it's only because of him. The fact that we can gather in this beautiful sanctuary and fellowship and partake of his word. Knowing that our brothers and sisters are dying everywhere, waking up to bombs here and there and just all manner of suffering. Right? So we have much you know, to rejoice in. Jesus said um, in John 20, 29 and 31, this was after the resurrection. He had came back and many saw him. And, and his, many of his disciples, they didn't believe. They were like, oh, even though they walked with him for three years, it's like they didn't believe. And don't be, we're not going to be quick to judge them because I know that that's us. We're no different, Right. But he said in John 20, 29, 31, Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, 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 Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 
God's word is living, right? And again, we never we didn't walk with Jesus like they did, but we walk with him daily, spiritually, because he's in us. The result of our faith should be just an overwhelming joy. Overwhelming joy. So in verse uh, 9, he says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So this phrase is in, in verse 9 is just referring to that ultimate outcome that we're all waiting for, which is to be with Christ, to be with him in all of his glory and everything that he's done. That's the end result uh, of our faith is we have eternal life with God. And the, it says in that verse 10 that the prophets inquired and searched diligently, right? Because they, they preached of the Messiah to come, Right? They knew he was coming, but they didn't get to experience and fully know and understand what we know today. We have the full counsel of God. We have the entire word of God, right? And we're living in the grace that they were waiting, not that they didn't experience, but that they were preaching about, you know. We're living in the fulfillment of what the Old Testament prophets were telling others about. What a, what a wonderful thing. What a, what a wonderful thing. So for us, again, what is the application? We tell people we need to be sharing the gospel message with others so they too can experience that inexpressible joy. It says, in, um, again, in uh, just verse 11, Searching what what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would come. And again, we know that Christ suffered uh, and he told us that we would suffer. Um, That's a part of the Christian life, suffering is. And so again, the the prophets just kind of, they forewarned people of that, but they also talked of the glories that would come. And we're living in that now. Well, not living in that now. We're experiencing God's grace. But the glories to come will be the culmination of when Christ comes back for his church and when we're with him. And we will be with him. Some of those supporting scriptures that the prophets uh, talked about was Isaiah. And I just want to read that scripture. Isaiah 53, verse uh, 3 and 5, it says, He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. So again, Isaiah prophesied about the the sufferings of Christ. And Daniel Daniel 9, 26 says, Speaks, speaks about it as well when it talked about the Messiah being, Messiah being cut off. After, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So again, you know, Jesus is confirming just the sufferings that were necessary to fulfill the scriptures. We see that. It was necessary for him to go to the cross and die so that we may have life and that we may have life eternally. And then we go to verse 12. It says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Wow, you know, things which angels desire to look into. So the angels were so, you know, wondering, you know, why are, why are we so special? 
<laughs> right? God said we are. He says we're chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his special people. And they didn't quite understand maybe perhaps this grace, you know, but they desired to look into that. And so, again, we see in Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, it says, By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Right. So it's the Holy Spirit that helps us. It's the Holy Spirit that even helps us to accept Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals the deep things of God to us. The Holy Spirit does so much. He's the one that convicts us of sin, right? And that's what Christ gave us as part of his death and resurrection, that guarantee, that seal. We see in Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 to 40, it says, And all these have obtained a good testimony through faith. Speaking of those Old Testament prophets and believers, did not receive the promise. They did not receive the promise. They died before receiving the promise. It says, but God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you so much for your grace, Lord God. This verse lets us know that the Old Testament prophets long to see and hear the things that we are witnessing today, that we are living in today, right? They long to see that. They said they diligently searched, right? So for us, again, this letter that Peter wrote is for us. This letter in God's word gives us hope when he talks about that living hope for all circumstances, Jesus is our hope. We should have joy in our trials. We should have faith and love, not towards God, towards Jesus, towards the Holy Spirit, towards one another. There should be a gratitude because we have the assurance of our inheritance. We have the assurance of our faith. I encourage each of us daily to ask God to send people that we can share his message with, that we will be watchful, attentive, and not be ashamed of the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And we too, we should not be ashamed of the gospel and to share and tell people, because there will come a day when we will no longer have that opportunity to share and tell people, because Jesus will come back. So today is the day. Ladies, today is the day. So as we prepare to close out, I'm just going to ask you ladies to just close your eyes and bow your heads and allow the Holy Spirit to just seal his word in your heart. And today maybe there's someone here in the sanctuary. Maybe there's someone that's watching over the video. And I just pray right now if there is anyone that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, if there is anyone that is not sure about their salvation, that between them and God, they would just say this prayer in their heart. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner, and I need your grace and your mercy. I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I believe that three days later he rose again. I believe that he is sitting at the right hand right now by the Father. And Lord God, I'm asking you to come into my heart, cleanse me of all unrighteousness, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sins and live this life in and through me for the rest of my life. And I thank you. I thank you, Father, for your love. And so, ladies, I I thank each of you 
for your testimonies and for your witness. And Lord God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for choosing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.